alaikum and good morning to all of you who have joined. Thank you so much to each one of you who have taken the time on the Saturday morning to join us. I promise you it will be worth your while. For those of you who are new here, I am Raisa. I am the Startup Grind uh, Director for Durban. Just a little bit about Startup Grind and what it's about. So Startup Grind is a global platform for entrepreneurs. It was founded in Silicon Valley back in 2010 and currently operates in 600 cities and 125 countries, and this number is growing. One of our initiatives at Startup Brian is to host events and showcase successful entrepreneurs and CEOs like we are doing this morning. Usually, these, ev these events are held in person. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, all of our events in the 2021 year have been held virtually. We are, however, intending and hoping to host in-person events come 2022. So please do watch this space. Follow us on social media if you don't already. Our Instagram handle is startupgrind underscore Durban. I am so excited to introduce our speaker for today. Nafisa Farid, more commonly known as Nafisa Gray. Nafisa is the Chief Executive Officer of the I4 Group of Companies. She is also the co-founder of the Gray Foundation, which is a charitable institution. She's a wife and mom of two kids. She holds multiple degrees and, if I'm not mistaken, is still currently studying. Nafisa, you can correct me, or recently completed another degree. Uh, and I'm sure most of you here already know that she is also a blogger uh, with over 20,000 followers on Instagram. Nafisa, welcome. Thank you so much for giving freely of your time today. I know you have a crazy busy schedule this end of the year, both on a personal and work level. So again, welcome. Thank you, Jazakallah, for attending and for accommodating us. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm always, always happy to be able to give my time to forums like this. Thank you so much. Just, a, just before we proceed, just to let you know, for those participants who are wanting to pose questions to Nafisa, if you can just pose those questions to her in the chat, we will have a short question and answer session at the end, and we will try and cover as many of the questions, if not all of the questions, uh, obviously bearing the time. Also to let you know, for those of you who don't know already, for those of you who do follow Nafisa, you will know that she runs a mentorship program for entrepreneurs. This is completely voluntary. It's a personal initiative and Nafisa receives no monetary benefit from it. She does already have her intake for the 2022 and I think the 2023 period as well. However, because of Nafisa's passion for helping others and empowering and inspiring others, she has very generously agreed to offer one of the participants at today's event a one-on-one -on -one mentorship session. But the catch is you need to interact with us, okay? So I would like this event to be interactive. You can chat to us. Uh, you can ask questions to Nafisa, which you can address at the end. If you're a business owner or aspiring startup, um, you can share which business on the name of your business or type of business that you currently own or run. If you have any business ideas or entrepreneurship tips which you'd like to share with us, you can do that as well. Um, and if you do interact at the end of this event, um, Nafisa will choose uh, one lucky participant who will be eligible for that one-on-one -on -one mentorship session with her. And I promise you that it will be very beneficial to you. Just to start off, Nafisa, I think as, many of, as much as many of the participants today probably do know a bit about your life and what you do from your social media platforms, I want to start off with a brief introduction about yourself. So if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, uh, your background and your education and a bit about where you're from. So I was born in KZN um, from, in a very conservative family. Um, my dad was, he was in a job and I think around probably seven to eight years old, he decided to bridge into the life of self-employment. So um, I had the benefit of watching a startup in action um, from my father, um, watch the ups and downs, the whole hustle, the really tough, tough moments. I mean, us as kids felt it as well financially at many times. So it was, it was, it was a very eye-opening experience. Um, I moved to Johannesburg at the age of 21. Um, 
you know, my goal was to start by myself. Um, I didn't want anything from the family. I, I, there was many reasons for that. I wanted to see what I was capable of by myself. Um, and I also wanted to be able to own my own success. Um, I didn't know what that was going to mean, whether it was going to be success or failure, um, but I wanted to find out that myself. So I moved to Johannesburg at 21. I've been here for about 16 and a half years. Um, from an educational perspective, I started with a diploma in food technology. For those that know like um, what it's like, I had parents who basically chose my studies for me. So I was not very happy going into it, but it, 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 it is what it is. I successfully completed it. I won't say it wasn't an exciting career. It was. Um, it just wasn't for me. Um, I kind of figured that, that out very quickly. Um, I think it was... Uh, in my last job where I had so many goals and aspirations. And when I kind of figured out how long it would take me to be able to reach that in the career world, um, I came to a rude awakening that I was going to have to make it by myself um, if I wanted to reach it in the time frame that I, you know, perceived I could I could accomplish that. So that was when I left the career and started my hustle, because that's the best way to explain it was an absolute hustle. Um, you know, I always like to say that education is not, you know, a determining factor in being able to go into self-employment, because apart from just a diploma in food technology, that was all I had. I only um, embarked on an MBA around, I think, 25 in entering 26. And that was when my business was established it was successful so I didn't really need that background to be able to do what I did um, I am currently waiting for my results um, for my master's in finance Phew, guys that was like really hectic studying it in a COVID year and having another kid um, so I've completed it it was two and a half years of my dissertation and apart from that, I have many other qualifications. Um, I'm certified in implementing ISO. Uh, those are just basically, um, you know, qualifications that I embarked on to be able to upskill the business, to understand how to operate more professionally in the industry that I operate in. Um, I have qualifications in solar installations, um, even when it comes to being an installer and putting up panels myself. The reason wow. behind it is because I really like to understand what my team is doing. And the more I understand what their job scope is, the better I am um, as an entrepreneur and as a leader of the company. Oh, um, Navisa, so it's a vast difference from your initial qualification in food technology to what you're actually uh, doing now uh, in terms of your current profession. Navisa, if you could tell us a bit about, and you mentioned that it's been a hustle <laughs> from the time you started, and obviously I'm assuming there were a lot of challenges um, that you experienced, which we'll cover a bit later on, but if you could tell me what inspired your entrepreneurial journey, what was your key driving force? So what made you go out there and actually make a start? Look, I've always loved um, the installation industry. I kind of figured that out when I was working in the food industry. I loved, um, I loved the actual interaction of being able to work in silos. So I, I kind of knew that was my passion. Um, I loved creating things. Um, I realized that during food technology, because food technology is basically designing a new item into the market or improving an item that currently exists. Um, when it comes to designing a new item, it's basically just like entrepreneurship. It's starting a concept, um, understanding your market research, and then building from there, and then hoping that the the you know the um, individuals that you hope it would uh, that would appreciate the pro product would love it as much as you loved it. So I kind of had that burning desire. At from then, um, I remember having a discussion with the supply chain director of the company at that time, and I loved his job. So I turned around and said, you know, um, how long will it take me to be sitting on your seat? And he says, Nafisa, you know, these are all the qualifications that you need to have. And around the age of 42, I promise you, you'll be sitting in my seat. And I, I sat back and I said, whoa, 42 years old. I'm like, I can do your job. Maybe I was a bit overzealous, but inside me, I knew I could do it. Not at that point in time but at an earlier age um, and at that point I realized that no 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 I can't I can't um, sign myself up to that and I, I just decided to go into the world of entrepreneurship and you know I found an, um, an, an area in the market that appealed to me that I felt that I could capitalize on and I just took the risk. 
Wow. So, you know, I can actually hear the passion uh, for what you do uh, when you speak about it. But this is a, a common question uh, that aspiring entrepreneurs always ask is, how much money do I actually need to get started? What is your advice when it comes to sourcing funding for your startup? And can you give us some um, initial financial planning tips for business owners and for the participants who have joined us today? Look, I know it's very disheartening when you want to start a business and you have no capital. I've been there, done that. Um, you know, I find that maybe it's, it's harsh, harsh to say that, you know, complaining you don't have capital is an excuse. But, you know, there's so many success stories, not only in our country, but around the world um, and in history that show that individuals can start a business from virtually nothing. So when I started my business, I had nothing. Um, I had no assets to offer the bank surety. I did not have, um, you know, large amounts of capital that I could even provide some comfort to the bank. So technically at that point, nobody would want, would want to fund me, nobody. Um, at that point, I also didn't know much about um, looking for investors. So I can't say that I bridged into that area at that point, um, but I had to start from basically nothing. And it's very difficult. Listen, when you don't have capital, everything becomes harder. You know, you've got to be stringent. You've got to decide what to invest, what little resources you have. You've got to also be able to survive because while you're starting a business, uh, rent still has to get paid. You're still got to eat. Um, the lights still have to be on. So, you know, I had all of that stress with me. Um, and you know, from what I what I've seen in my journey and where I am today, I can honestly say that never ever allow that to be the factor that you know holds you back from starting something. It, it definitely does not mean that you won't be able to achieve it, and that you won't be able to see your business one day grow to where you envision it to be. That's from inspiring. a finance. From a financial planning perspective, you know, um, I always say it's so important to monitor your hands and sense whether you're starting up from nothing or you've reached a point of success. Um, that is a huge, huge factor in being able to grow and flourish. So, you know, I've always noticed when I've worked with uh, through mentorship and with small businesses that that is an area that is often not looked at. Um, when I started, you know, I didn't have um, a safety net to be able to run a whole year by myself. And given the fact that I was, you know, living and managing this myself, I needed to ensure that I could survive. So that would mean like and seeing what I had in my bank account and understanding how long was I going to survive with that money. And then breaking it down to the bare necessities. Because, you know, if you're starting up from scratch and you don't have a cash like you're not cash rich, um, you can't afford to live live your best life at that point. Um, and that's what I had to understand. I couldn't go shopping. I couldn't buy clothes. You know, I couldn't go out and eat on evenings. I had to understand what I needed to do with my money and how long I could stretch it. So that's, that's a good uh, tip in terms of budgeting. Um, and making those sacrifices to make that red stretch longer. Um, and, it, and it sounds a, easy. I'm going to say uh, now it's not because when I started, I was 22. And that's when everyone around me. And at that age, age, I mean, yeah. spending, we're living you know, their best life, not worried about exactly. saving. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Nafisa actually also hosts, um, and I didn't mention it at the beginning, uh, a business workshop. Nafisa, what's the um, title of your workshop? This is the Grey Blogs, Grey Blogs Workshop. She did host an event last year in Kauteng, which was very successful. Um, she has been planning an event for Durban uh, for a long time because I believe that she has received um, a lot of requests for it. Um, and hopefully it's something which she is targeting, I believe, in the 2022 year. So follow her um, on Instagram, follow the Grey Blog Business Workshop, and I'm sure you'll receive more updates on uh, that in the 2022 year. If I look at Power for Less, which is uh, the company which you're the CEO of, it has definitely grown exponentially over the past few years. From your perspective, do you believe in starting small and building your business in small steps gradually over time, or just going all out at the onset in terms of 
product quantity, the marketing campaign, as well as the capital outlay or investment. I find that most startups are afraid uh, of failure. So they're very hesitant to invest too much too soon at the outset. So that's where critical decision making comes in um, to decide how much to invest and where to invest, where you're going to get the best return on investment. So, you know, Powerfulness, obviously, when we started this business, it took a lot of investment, a lot. To be, to be honest, every single new division in the business has run the same way that I ran from the first day. It doesn't change. Um, you've got to keep on putting money towards this vision that you have to be able to put into the market there's still that 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 lag phase when you're just losing money and then that slow growth phase until the market is like okay we can trust this person or we can trust the product so for me from day one when it came to investment there was always two critical areas that i always focused in and that was firstly the product and secondly the marketing the reason behind that is um, you need to be able to put a product of quality out into the market. If you want the uptake that you envision that that product is going to, um, you know, deliver into the market, you've got to put the money behind it. Um, if you if you go into the market with something that looks or feels of poor quality, that's exactly how the market is going to see it. Um, if you must, I always believe in look, sitting back and asking myself as an individual, how would I look at that product? And that has always been, uh, you know, a great help to me, you know, and we've used it like right through like last year, we spent two years with the concepts on powerful less that we were going to bring into the market. And our launch date, believe it or not, was March of 2020, can you even, and then COVID no. started. Um, like we had everything planned, TV adverts, you know, radio interviews and stuff like that. And then I had to sit back and ask myself, okay, so I'm going to go into the market, but now I need to understand what is going to give me an ROI and what is not going to give me an ROI. So when I looked at it as an individual, I was also scared of this new pandemic and what it meant for me as a human being, my family, and then the business. So I had to relook at marketing because at that point, I was not interested in any clothes, shopping, or anything anyone wanted to punt on TV or adverts because all we were doing was listening to the updates on COVID. How was it going to affect us? What was the infection rate? So I looked at it and I said, okay, fine. Those avenues for marketing was, was not going to work for us. What marketing um, avenues could we use that would work with the market slowly in gentle steps until people reached a point where they were more calm and more settled in moving on with life? So it's all about putting your money where you're going to get the biggest return. So if you're a startup, my suggestion would be product, product quality. Always ask yourself, if you were a consumer, how would you look at this product that you are going to put out? If you want to reach the middle to high LSM, but you invest the very minimal in your product from a look and feel perspective, do you actually believe that it's going to appeal visually to anyone in that LSM? And you must remember, we're very visual people. As much as we like to believe that, you know, we want to think about people's character and, and who they are first, the reality is that we, our impression is first on visual and then, then secondly, what we, what we decide on an individual. So you have that one impression in the market, that one impression, and that impression counts. It's your first step in, and that's how people recognize you. So if you put something that is of poor quality, and then you upscale it, so people are always going to remember that the first products you sold was crap. So I would say um, if you're going into, into the market of entrepreneurship and you're putting out product, whatever product it is, always invest in your product quality. And secondly, be very critical about the avenues that you are going to market it in because not not every avenue works for every business so that's very interesting uh in that you know there may be times in your business where you need to re-strategize that you did and go back to the board the drawing board and re-innovate and potentially rethink your uh, marketing strategies or business strategies which you already had in mind that is a your entrepreneurship journey has been a long one right um what challenges have you faced or, or did you face in the initial phases of setting up a startup? 
Sure, there are so many. And if I tell you that even today, um, as a business, we, I still encounter challenges. It's something that you will never, you, you'll never get over. Um, when I started as a startup, you know, my first worry was the fact that I didn't have sufficient capital to be able to get to where I wanted to be. Um, you know, I, I was in the industry of security and I was up against like giants. I was like in their eyes a nobody. Um, you know, I, it, there was a lot of insecurities that came with it um, that created a fear of failure. Um, one being that I operated the business from my home landline. I mean, that's hustle, guys. Um, sitting at my dining room table, creating my own PDFs, um, creating my own marketing, um, you know, pamphlets and campaigns. So firstly, you know, there was the lack of capital and then obviously getting into the market. And that's very difficult. I, you know, I completely can relate to small businesses that I mentor when they say that they battle with uptake. You know, um, when you don't have a physical presence, you don't have a business address, you don't have that business look and feel. You are naturally looked at as, you know, somebody who's providing solutions or products of poor quality. And it makes the sales so much harder, so much harder. In my mind, I, you know, I had big dreams. I thought, okay, you know what, six months time, I'm going to be rolling in the money. And, you know, I would be able to be self-sufficient and be able to, you know, live life in a sort of better, in a better way. Um, didn't happen. Um, I think that was, you know, it brought me down to earth very quickly because it took me about two and a half years and two and a half years, um, I didn't have money to be able to survive two and a half years. I had a credit card and little savings. And, you know, the reality is I rolled my credit card. So I, there was times when I couldn't pay expenses. So I'd use my credit card and then pray to God that, you know what, I would get paid in time to be able to settle it without incurring interest. Um, in that two and a half years, I had to downsize majorly. That was, that was like a, I don't know, a bucket of cold water on me. You know, from having a nice apartment, um, I couldn't afford the rent any longer. So I moved into a one bedroom. You know, I, I never regretted when I look back because it was, you know, a defining moment in my life. I think my apartment was the size of my childhood room. And, you know, my, my fridge was on the carpet and everything is, was in one. I had only a small amount of space to be able to put my groceries in a fridge. The stupid landlord painted over the mold in my very tiny cupboard. And not even two months later, my clothes went fraught mm -hmm. because the mold came out. So, you know, that, that's a reality of, of starting a small business. You need to be, if you believe in it, like really, really passionately, you must be able to take all the knocks that come. Um, and then, you know, when you're a small business, you face um, a lot of challenges with customers. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult to explain, but a lot of disrespect comes with it. Um, firstly, they don't want to pay the price. You've got to hustle on prices. When I started, um, I found myself at many times like selling my solutions much cheaper than what it actually was worth because people would determine what they were willing to pay for it. Um, to try and get a deposit from a client, sure, they'll pay like, you know, another company like 50% deposit, 80% deposit. But with me, I had to deliver at my own cost first and then hope and pray that the individual pays me. Um, at many times in that first year, you know, um, I encountered situations where I was begging clients for money. Um, they would decide whether they're going to pay me what my invoice was at the end after I delivered the items. Um, or they would come back to me and turn around and tell me, oh, you know what, um, we decided we're going to pay you installments. By the time I actually recovered the amount that my solution was valued at, I mean, guys, time value of money, it was worth nothing. It really was. Six months to get paid back on a solution I delivered and installed. By six months' time, I mean, it was, it was useless to me. So, you know, for me, that when I look back, that was definitely... Um, that was definitely some of the issues sure. that I yeah. encountered. You obviously experienced a lot of challenges, but I think uh, key, it's key to, you know, persevere, believe in yourself and just soldier on. <laughs> and, and also, you know, in the market, you know, you don't have buying power. So you're up against um, 
companies that buy in economies of scale. They buy in volumes. And then when you're starting, you can't afford to buy in volumes. Yes. So your margin becomes so much smaller. Smaller. And then you have customers that take your price and make it even more smaller. So technically, you're selling it just to cover expenses to be able to build a customer base. So, you know, uh, Nafisa, it's interesting that you mentioned customer base. You know, the common adage, customer is king. Uh, I actually work in the service-based industries, and I mean, it's true. Um, The success of a business lies in a customer to a very large extent. You need willing buyers to generate revenues and ultimately be profitable. How did you build that successful customer base, and what tips do you have for business owners and for our participants here today? Look, it's difficult um, when you start a business and you try to get your first customer. Let me tell you that because I, you know, the first thing someone asks you, like, where did you install this before? Or who else bought your product? And you're like, who are you going to give us a reference? So I found that to get the first customer is definitely definitely the hardest part, especially in the industry I decided to go in where customer base and references played a huge part in someone deciding to take a solution and put it into their business or their home. Um, So while I I still believe that customer is king, um, because at the end of the day, um, how you treat them is an impression on your business. uh, I also understand how difficult it can be with customers at times and how um, stressful it can be when you're dealing with a difficult customer that firstly doesn't want to pay or just makes the whole sales journey extremely difficult. So let me tell you something. I did not participate in speech contests in school. I was very, very insecure, extremely. Um, I never stood on stage. I was probably the tree in the drama contest, you know, the one just stands there and waves the leaves. Um, because I was it's very hard to believe that is <laughs> Trust me, it's like anyone who knows me from school days would know that. And, I, you know, I would literally freeze up in any forum. And then I started a business where I didn't have any sales representatives. So my bread and butter and survival meant that I needed to cold call. And those that have ever cold called in their lives know that it, firstly, it can be a very demeaning experience. It is very scary because you're just literally walking in and you're just like throwing yourself at a customer and hoping that they're going to say, okay, I'll give you like five minutes of my time. Pray and hope that. I mean, I've had many doors that were slammed in my face, people setting up meetings and while I'm sitting there and paid my petrol to get to their office decides not to pitch up. Um, I cold called a lot. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you like how much of a hustle I put in. So I was, my goal was to be able to deliver my solutions into the petroleum sector. That was my vision. Visions are very important. It comes with planning at the onset when you decide what you want to embark in. And that's where I saw the niche market. Um, there were service stations everywhere. So I knew that if I could put my footprint in there, I had a huge customer base. So I ended up uh, taking a very poorly paid job um, in that sector. And I managed an entrepreneur's um, three sites. Um, One of the big selling points for him to take me on was the fact that, you know, I used to do material data sheets in the food industry. And he was, um, you know, bridging into the lubricant industry with, um, you know, motor oil lubricants. And he needed to have the material data sheets for those lubricants. So I was like, okay, I'll do it at a fraction of the price. Um, So it was a win-win situation. It was really difficult, let me tell you, because, you know, I always find on Instagram, people always ask me like, how do you deal with society? How do you deal with what people say? You know, to I dealt with a lot of people looking down at me. Like, you know, I qualified with the food industry, had a huge, um, you know, road of success, of potential success before me. And here I was working for someone at a fraction of what um, my salary was. And I mean, it was, it was a huge step down, a huge, huge step down. But what I saw value in was that I was able to rub shoulders with 
people that were in, in his industry and they didn't know it at that time, but I knew it that they were going to be my customers one day. So I got to know their names, understand like their turnover in their sites, um, what their needs were. I also got an understanding of what the issues were in that filling station that my solution could address. So it allowed me to be able to position my brand in a way that I knew would be accepted. Um, and then obviously I left the job and then went into the work industry and it was very difficult. Um, I had to sell my solutions at a fraction of the price just to be able to get a few customers. Um, Firstly, just trying to get the customers is the most difficult uh, part. It took me a long while. And when I'm saying a long while, let me tell you that I went through sometimes three months of no customers. My first customer did not come in the first month. I cold called multiple, multiple filling stations. And that meant me investing money in firstly my day, my cell phone bill, um, prepaid airtime at that time. And then obviously um, my fuel. Um, and without a return at the end of the month. And it was so scary. It was so scary because in those first three months, you start to doubt yourself. Like, am I wasting my time? Like, nobody wants my solution. Um, you know, how long can I survive? It's three months and I've only spent money and I've made nothing. But eventually, you know, you knock at that door that will open up and say, okay, well, you know what? We'll give you a chance. And that was my first customer. And that became my first reference point. And I needed to make sure that I delivered a world-class solution so that my reference customer, even though they paid me virtually like nothing, um, was a good reference to be able to get the next one. Wow. Lavisa, you mentioned at the beginning, you said, uh, you said that your goal was to get into the petroleum industry. And you mentioned how important that setting that goal was for yourself. And obviously by setting the, that goal and with your planning, and your ambition, you managed to achieve that. I have been following you on social media for a while and I find your content to be very inspiring. Obviously that's the reason that I'm hosting Thank you this you. morning with Startup Grind. You often speak on your social media platforms about setting goals, about, about planning and getting the, uh, or putting the necessary steps in place in order to achieve your desired outcome. Now, we all have ideas. We all know what we want to do. Um, it's all in our heads, but there are, we, a lot of us just lack that ability to actually you know, act upon it and implement it. So in your experience and in your opinion, um, how would one systematically set up these goals in order to achieve success? Look, I think um, being in the food industry definitely helped me to understand that I needed to plan beforehand. Any product, even corporates and listed companies and global companies, before they put any product into the market, there's a lot of planning that goes behind it. And that should be an indication as to how important planning is. Because if a global company that you know, um, is one of the largest companies in the world providing a food product to the world. Um, still invest in the market research, the planning, um, the social groups, understanding what um, the market will perceive it. You know, they do taste testing. The moment a customer did not like the taste, boom, we're not even going there. Um, if they can invest so much of time into that, what makes us think that we are any different? And that was one of the most important fundamentals that I applied into starting up my dream business. Um, and I always, whenever I do mentorship, I always say that, you know, we put so much of um, time and effort into planning. Firstly, if we want to lose weight, we plan our goal. Well, in like eight months time, I want to be 10 kilos lighter. That's a goal. You've set a goal that in eight months time, you want to be 10 kilos lighter. If you decide you want to start eating healthy, you start that progression. You say, okay, fine. I'm going to start the first month trying to implement fruit, fruit into my lifestyle or whatever the case may be. That's a goal. That's a, that's a goal with a plan. Um, if you want to be able to, even when, you, when you're sick, you know, there's a plan in how, how many tablets you take, when you take it. So we always put so much of effort into all of those things. And we decide that starting a business does not need a plan because everything needs a plan. My God, like, unlike many people, I cannot cook without a plan. I need a recipe that says you need to put 
two cups of this to be able to get the food to be edible. Mm -hmm. The moment I veer off course, I mean, we're on Uber Eats that night. So everything falls according to a plan. And business is exactly the same. You can't go in and decide, ah, oh, you know what? I want to sell this product here. And yeah, no idea who your LSM is. What is the customer you are, uh, you are approaching? You know, um, what is the market price? Have you done market research on what the price is? What are your competitors selling it at? What do you feel that you should sell it at? Um, have you decided which province you want to sell it in? Why do you want to approach that province? Um, at what point do you want to reach other areas? What is the goal of the future? Plans create in your mind the direction in where you are going. And without direction, you are literally going to be taking a million wrong turns. But if you put a plan and a goal behind it, you know what your target is. And you, it reminds you constantly that this is what I need to work towards. And it holds you accountable. So when anyone says that they are, you know, they can't do it or they, they you know, feel unsure about doing it, that is you not believing enough in what you are capable of. The day you put something on pen and paper and you say, in so many, in three years time, this is what the turnover of the business is. It's scary. It's scary because now you're making nothing, but you want to be able to earn that. It's holding yourself accountable. And that is where people feel fear in being able to dream big and say, that is what I want to achieve because the fear that holds them back is maybe I won't achieve that. Does that mean I failed? That's, that's very good advice. You know, Nafisa, you mentioned not being able to cook in the kitchen. Um, there's a recipe which you've shared on your social media. It's the, it's the Nando's chicken recipe. Uh, and I think my, I know my sister makes that every week for our family. And she shared that recipe with both myself and uh, the rest of my extended family. And they've all tried that recipe. And I can assure you that they love it and they make it. Wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Let me just clarify something. If you checked on that tab, it said, Grey's Nando's oh, yeah, recipe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It did not, so, so it did the not say nothing to me. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I'm not taking so the credit for that. Sent, got screenshot and sent to me uh, by my sister. So, no, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> but either way, it's a favorite, I think, in my family. Um, Rafisa, I have a lot of respect uh, for you as a fellow female businesswoman. You are literally shattering all those glass ceilings um, when it comes to being a female leader and CEO. And I think this is um, something or a question more for my personal uh, benefit. How do you hold your own in a boardroom full of males? Um, and I'm sure you probably have faced challenges uh, being a female entrepreneur and leader and how have you managed to overcome these challenges so let me just be clear that this is something that females will not get over um, because in 2021 i'm still facing it um, i you know there's times when i walk into the boardroom and you know i'm dealing with a new crowd and the first thing that you get is that look that that maybe she's fronting. Maybe it's just like black woman owned, but maybe there's people in the background. Trust me, I still get wow. that till today. Um, you know, very recently this year, I went into um, a boardroom with a corporate company. And when I walked out, I heard this comment that when she spoke, you could clearly see she was the CEO. So what was I before that? Like when I was not speaking, was I not the CEO? Was I just sitting there and filling a space? So it's something that I've, I've come to accept that, you know, we can't control how other people perceive us. That is something that in any area of your life, you're always going to deal. Someone is always going to think something of you and make, uh, you know, a perception without even giving you a chance. So, you know, I never look at it as shattering glass ceilings or anything. I know when I walk into the boardroom what I am there to deliver. I know what I'm capable of. Um, whether somebody sees the value in it or not, that's their problem. Um, not every boardroom I walk into, um, I walk out with a deal or with, you know, a certain company deciding to procure it. And I always look at it from the positive perspective. I always say, okay, there's always a positive in a situation. So if I walk in and I, I deal with 
individuals, you know, deciding that, you know, possibly I don't know what I'm doing in an industry that is male dominated. If I walk out of the boardroom and they decide they're not going ahead with me and they're going with another company that happens to be male owned, I always look at it as like, maybe, you know what, I've, I've left them with a different impression of a female owned business, that the next time a female walks into their boardroom, they won't make the assumption that she's fronting or that she doesn't know what she's doing in that industry, they would give that woman a forum. So there's always positives in negative situations. And, you know, the thing about, you know, male dominated environments, you know, like anything in life, um, people like to put labels on things. I don't even understand where certain industries became male dominated, but we didn't label it that way. And when I entered this industry that is male dominated, I never looked at myself as a female. Yes, I'm female. But when I went into the business world, I never looked at myself as a female in that industry. I looked at as myself as an entrepreneur who has a product that they want to be able to get the market to appreciate and value. And that was it. The only time in my life I've heard male dominated was when I've been asked that question. Nafisa, how do you feel working in a male dominated industry? What are the like, you know, issues that you deal with? And that's when I was like, oh, I'm a female in a male dominated. So it's always at the end of the day, the foundation of how you feel and what your value is and what you have to deliver. And whatever other people think that's their business, but it shouldn't change what, what you, what you are capable of. That's very important. I think uh, it's important that you believe in yourself and it's all up to, you know, the image which you are portraying to others as opposed to what others are perceiving of you. Um, Lafisa, obviously there are a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs on this forum. What would you say are the top three skills um, needed to be a successful entrepreneur? Or do you think that it, it is a skill or there are skills uh, which can be harnessed in order for you um, to be successful uh, at a startup or at you know uh, owning your own business? So, you know, in the Grey Blogs workshop, I start off with the first skill. And the first skill is not something that you need to follow. It's the foundation. And before you have a foundation of a business, you have to have a foundation of yourself. The foundation of any business from inception till the point of where you're a, a large company is still yourself. It's how you believe, the passion, the perseverance, and the patience. Simple. If you don't have that, you can have any plan, any business plan, any strategy out there. But if you don't believe in yourself, that plan is worthless. So, you know, before you even go into a business, you must first understand what you're doing, why it's driving you, and um, why do you believe in the product? And, you know, what do you want to achieve? And how much do you believe in it to be able to deal with everything that comes? So the first skill is yourself. That's a skill you've got to work on. Because when the, when the, when the going gets tough, that's you the one that decides I can't do this. I need to go into the work world again. And let me tell you, I've had many, many moments when I started up where I doubted myself and things got really hard. And I said, you know, Nafi said, this is not working. Maybe I'm just not cut out for it. You know, um, I'd rather just go back and get a salary job because I knew I could survive on that. But if I didn't like muscle myself up and say, Nafi said, listen, yeah, this is your dream. This is your goal. You know, can you, can you believe in it? Do you really want to achieve it? to stop being, you know, a wuss and go and fight the next day. So the foundation, number one, the skill is you. The second thing is that you have to have a plan. And these are stuff that I learned on, like most of the stuff that I learned when I was growing my business was via Google. I always say on Instagram that people are very lazy, you know, and laziness is an excuse. There are so many opportunities for you to understand skills, um, to be able to get business plan templates, invoice templates, you know, understanding what, how to build a structure of a business. Everything is on Google. There are so many free things there. And that's how I got my business going. I use free templates, free PDF creators. And all it did was me putting in the effort. And that's difficult. It really is. It's easier to say, can you do something for me? Can you help me? Oh, I don't have the money. Therefore, I can't be able to do this. Um, so, you know, you planning and building a structure is very important because the structure is the second foundation of how a business grows. Having your cash flow in order, 
you know, understanding um, how much your business is going to need to survive, how much you are going to need to survive, you know, what is your market, what is your route to market. So that's where a business plan comes in place. And for me, a business plan is critical. It's absolutely critical when you're starting a business. And there's hundreds of business plan templates on the internet. I used it once and till today, when we start up a new division in the business, we go back to groundwork. We do a business plan. Yes, that's important. And it comes back to the planning. Um, Nabisa, I personally read up a lot on the habits of successful entrepreneurs and CEOs. What entrepreneurial tricks um, have you discovered to keep you focused and productive in your extremely busy day-to-day -day schedule? So I don't believe there's a one box fits all concept in life, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. While I read a lot of entrepreneurship books, listen to TED Talks, there's many times when, you know, there's suggestions that come your way that I don't agree on because it doesn't work for me. So I'm going to give you guys my tips that work for me. And as an individual, you will know what makes you enter the day at your very best. So I have found that waking up early for prayer works for me. It gives me a clarity. It, you know, clears my mind. The first couple of times that I did it, oh, it was like I was an absolute monster at the office because I was sleep deprived. But eventually I found that at a, if I woke up early, my brain was fresh. By the time I entered the office, I was charged. Um, I thrive off a morning workout because at many times I end up having a very few hours of sleep at night and that morning workout, be it healthy or not guys, don't judge me. Um, that morning workout literally charges my endorphins and I am powered to enter the day. I find that the days that I don't work out, I feel drained. I feel miserable and how you enter your day is so critical. So, so, so critical. Um, affirmations, I'm always punting this on my page. And affirmations are so powerful. It's, you know, it's how you train your mind to be able to approach anything in your day or your life. So I start off my day with affirmations. Today's going to be a great day. If I've had the worst Tuesday you can ever imagine, Wednesday morning, I'm like, Tuesday was bad, but today's going to be great. And then if you know, Wednesday is bad. Thursday is going to be great. So it's always, it's cultivating the mental and physical space that you will perform best in. So, you know, there's many, many suggestions out there. I find those things work for me. And I also, you know, want to grow my business. Um, businesses, I always say is you've got to, you've got to develop. The market is always changing. Um, People are changing, products are changing, needs are changing. You've got to evolve with it. So I find reading up helps me a lot. It opens my mind. It teaches me what's happening in the industry, what's happening in the world, where are consumers moving towards, what are their needs, how, are, how is it changing, you know, um, how are people's pockets changing? And if their pockets are changing, how does that impact my delivery of a solution into the market? So I find always keeping abreast makes my mind thrive, it keeps it awake, and it never gets lazy. That's very good advice, Nafisa. Um, Nafisa, I find that, and, and I think you can see that on this platform, there are quite a few females here who have joined, uh, although this is not specific uh, to females and, and does apply to both. But we find that majority of the workforce these days, especially the younger generation, are prioritizing their work-life balance uh, when they're seeking job opportunities. How do you juggle being a wife, a mom of two kids, um, and all, your one kid is, is still very small, and you know, managing it so well and excelling at both? Uh, how do you manage to do this successfully on a day-to-day -day basis? So, you know, with this question, I was thinking about how I was going to answer it, and I always find that we put so much of emphasis on wowing others that are capable of doing this. Like, oh my God, like, I don't know how she does this. When in actual fact, we are all capable of it. Um, is it hard? Yes. Um, do I fail at times? Yes. Um, do I ignore my kids in moments? Yes. Um, I just work 
to be able to focus my time on the areas that are important to me. So I always say there's 24 hours in a day. And we, we as human beings like to make excuses. And, and the reasons why I can comfortably say this is because I was not, I didn't walk into this work world cushioned. You know, I've hustled, I've struggled, I've dealt with every possible failure you can imagine. I started up a successful business, lost absolutely everything. And then had to start again from scratch, which is the most painful experience you can ever imagine when you've sacrificed your youth and then you've built a massive in business and then you lose everything and you think, shit, I'm too old to start all over again. But so I can say the juggling is based on how important are the things that I juggle? How valuable are they to me that I need to make sure that they get adequate time in my day? So I'm very stingy when it comes to time. Very, very stingy. Um, I analyze my day very, very clinically. Maybe that makes me a very boring person, but I'm very, very critical about every opportunity that comes my way. How much do I have to invest in? And investment is not money, right? It's not always money. It's time and your physical presence in that space. What am I going to get from it? And what am I going to lose by me putting myself in that space? So I'm sure you guys have seen on social media that I've always shared like that, you know, I generally decline um, to be in, at too many social events. I don't do reviews on my page. Um, I don't use my page as a, as a review platform. Well, it's because firstly, that's time consuming for me. It means that I need to take out family time to be able to attend multiple events. And because I invest so much time into running a successful business, I cannot afford to prejudice my kids and my family by being out at night and going out to places. While I do believe in having a social life and uh, me time and things that are important to me, I work out. I don't have any kids around me at that time because I really don't want them around me. I don't even have my husband around me at that time. Um, you know, I spend time with my friends once in a while. They're not around me. But when I come home, they are my life. They're my circle. And I get happiness by seeing them thrive. So I know that if I decide to add on all these extras in my life that are not going to add value. And when I say value, please don't look at it that I'm saying that other people who are investing in it are not getting value. We all are driven differently. My value is my kids. I love them to bits. I work for myself, but the, the, the benefit eventually goes to them and they are a driving force in my life. Um, being a mom and a wife, gosh, there's nobody that lives a perfect life. So everything takes time. If you want your marriage to work, if you want to um, have good kids or you want to have kids that are successful, you've got to put time in it. Because just like how we fail, they fail as well. Just how, um, you know, um, marriages work, marriages fail as well. So it's all about deciding in, in your 24 hours what is important, what is valuable to you and valuable to your heart and your, your time and then deciding well. All of this other stuff is noise and I'm going to give it. So that is how I always say I juggle my time. I am stingy about where I invest it because my ROI is my kids and my family and my business. And these I forums love. here, it's 11 o'clock. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we yeah. really appreciate this, you giving up your this time. This makes me money. happy. Yeah, this makes me happy. So for me, there's an ROI involved in this. It's like somebody maybe learning something from it and going out there and making something of their lives or like looking at their business differently. For me, that's an ROI. So I'm stingy when some like something comes to me like this and I'm looking at it and say, what is the benefit? What am I getting from investing this time this morning? And because I see a benefit, I'm more than happy to do it. And, and I must tell you all that Latisa has invested a lot of time and energy into this and for those of you who have been um, following both Nafisa and myself on social media and have been receiving the Startup Grant emails, you will know that this event was actually scheduled about a month back. And unfortunately, we had to cancel it at the last minute due to unforeseen load shedding. She is very busy at the moment, but she has made the time uh, to be here today. And I love that you said that we're all capable of doing it because, I mean, I, I laughed when at the beginning you said we all look at these individuals and we say, wow, how are they managing to do it? Because, you know, I look at your platform a lot of the time and I think, wow, she's a superwoman, you know. Uh, but yes, you're right. We're all capable of achieving it if we put our minds to it and prioritize um, accordingly. 
the visa we are ending um, we're towards the end of the interview segment and we will be moving shortly on to the Q&A session. But before we finish, I just want to have two questions left for you. And the one is more of a personal question. What has been your most satisfying moment in business? Um, what would you consider to be your greatest achievement or, or milestone in your entrepreneurial journey? So firstly, um, to date, and I mean to date right to this moment here, I still at times get goosebumps when, you know, my team comes back and they share with me a reference from a customer and they say like, wow, you know, this was such a valuable investment. I still get that feeling that shivers of like somebody still sees the value, like the happiness of the happiness that I invest in being able to do that. Um, so it's a it's 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 long term that never goes away my most successful moments was when us as a team delivered six and a half million um custom made cfl globes into the country um i always say between that and another project it was a moment where i was this business was recognized as a value to the country that we were capable of being able to create and develop and deliver within a time frame, something that changed the load of the country. And the second one was like a, a project that I was dealing with. Let, let me tell you, it was very difficult. And, you know, um, it was um, self-funding a solution into a province that, to reduce thousands of megawatts off the grid. And the concept was that the customer was not going to spend any money from an installation perspective um, nothing product whatever the, the value the customer got from their savings and it was very scary because um there was a lot of like surety involved in it if it didn't work out i was the only one that was going to lose and seeing that at the end of the month that the customer actually saw the benefit we worked on was the most fulfilling moment of my life because I was able to achieve something with my team that did not take anything away from a province, but actually gave back. And in doing so, we still made profit. So it was definitely when wow, I look back as landmark moments. That is, I can just, again, hear the passion in your voice when you speak about these project, uh, projects and the milestones which you've achieved. Um, and whilst we're on the topic of products, uh, Nafisa, you've been um, in the media quite a bit in the past two weeks for a new product which you've launched called the Mobi Vault, which is an innovative um, load shedding solution, uh, which can be used by a lot of our attendees here. So quickly in 15 to 20 seconds, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> that I can, can talk a lot. <laughs> if you can just... Um, give our participants some information about this innovative solution, which could be of great help to them uh, in their households or businesses. Uh, I'd appreciate that. So I'm not even going to sell it. I'm just going to tell you what made me decide that this is a market we wanted to bridge into. You know, we did market research. And while we we're in the sector for years and years and years, we looked at the fact that many people cannot afford solar solutions. Things are unaffordable. And it's always an area where it's been overlooked. And that was a niche market. That takes market research to decide where you can capitalize on. So we've been in business has been built on quality um, products that last years and years. And we decided that we're going to invest in R&D into a product that was going to appeal to every home that could not bridge into solar immediately. It could run their home. It's mobile. Um, and it is warranted for five years. So a lot of times people go into the market and they provide something for a different LSM, but it's junk. So when we decided that we were going to create the, the platform and the planning behind this, there was delivery of quality and delivery of a solution that would serve everyone, whether it's mobile food vendors, um, small households, people traveling between provinces, and it can basically um, charge without ESCOM. So technically it comes with panels and everything. So like everything, guys, like everything takes planning. It takes making time to understand the environment that you're working in and understanding how you can capitalize of areas that people just don't seem to think is worthwhile. But every customer 
if you develop something with of quality that's going to address a need at a price that is going to be appealing, you will be able to capitalize in that market. Great. 15 Thanks, seconds. 10. And, for, <laughs> and for those of you who want to find out more about the product, um, I believe there's a lot of information on, is it Power for Less? That's correct. That is, uh, on Instagram, yes. Yeah. So if you follow Power for Less, you will find more details on that product uh, in particular. Raisa, before you like move to q and I'm going to just answer this very quickly. Okay. There was a question that you asked that um, what was, what are some of the advice that people say um, in, in the entrepreneurial sector that I don't yeah. agree with? So I'm going to put my, my, <laughs> my moment in. Yes. So one of the things that I don't agree with and I still don't agree with till today is the saying that they say, pay yourself first. Guys, that is the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my whole entire life. Because till today, as an entrepreneur, when you build your business up to have staff, and if you are not making turnover, you either the last person to get paid um, or you don't get paid at all. So I, I disagree with that completely because when, as long as I can remember when, you know, we started taking on more teams and more staff and, you know, we went through a bad month, the first person, even through COVID, the first person that we thought about was firstly like expenses and staff, making sure that they were fine. And then lastly, like what's left for us. So don't agree with that at all. I'm so glad that you covered that question because that was very good advice. Um, okay, so we've now reached uh, the end of our interview segment. There are a few questions and comments in the chat. I see a hand up um, and I will get to you uh, if you haven't posted your question uh, in the chat already. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through some of the comments. Uh, there's a lot of um, thumbs up. So in, uh, Azra says, so inspiring. Uh, we have Alison Joseph, who has said such motivation. Um, I think Azra agreed with some of the comments you made with regards to your hustle and your challenges and said it's so hard. Vahid said asked, um, and I think you dealt with this. I'm not sure whether you want to um, elaborate, but he asked or he or she asked, how do you deal with competition and pricing whilst you make the rands stretch? So, you know, this is an, an area that I love discussing in the workshop because, you know, I've, especially because I've been through it and I still am going through it. And I noticed that on Instagram, there's a lot of competition, especially when start, someone starts a business and someone goes and duplicates it. We cannot control the markets and we cannot control people. And there's always going to be someone that's either going to see an opportunity in what you're pro providing and decide to duplicate it and then cut prices or, you know, the markets who or the individuals that are in the markets and have been established decide to cut prices to be able to capitalize on the market at that certain time. It is what it is. It's going to happen. You can never change that. And I always say that we cannot, we as business owners and you as yourself as well, have to keep abreast of your competitors. Why? Because it makes you unique. It keeps you ahead of the game. It makes you understand what you need to do and what you need, what you don't need to do and how to improve on your business. Just like how they see you as a competitor, you've got to look at them as a competitor. And, you know, when it comes to people that are coming into the market and slashing prices or starting a new business that duplicates yours and slashing prices, you know, what someone can never do and what they can never copy is the passion that bred your dream. Someone can always copy a product, but they can never copy the resilience, um, the forward thinking and the, the foundation of that business that will out survive any competitor that decides to come into the market just for a moment. So, you know, if we start getting, you know, disheartened by the industry and what's happening, we will, you will never be able to grow a business. It is something that will never disappear. It's always going to be there. And you need to look at it as a way to constantly improve yourself and stay ahead of the game. That's a great answer and very good advice. Professor. Um, Keshri has said, I'm eagerly awaiting the Gray Foundations workshop in 2022. So I think just watch the space. Um, if you do follow Nafisa on social media, I'm sure she will be posting more about that. 
A.K. Ibrahim has said, leading by example, indeed, hence the helmet right by your side. Um, Nahid said, Nafisa, you are so inspiring, a real go-getter. I completely agree. Azra has asked, how does one go about overcoming the fear of failure? Look, a failure is always going to be there. Um, if I have to look at the amount of fa- times I failed in my life personally and professionally, um, I, I, I don't think there's a page that will cover all my failures. And if I had to look at failure as being something that I was afraid of, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have achieved today. So it's just, it's, it, failure is just that stuff that holds you back. Inside you, you know that you're capable of doing it. Let me tell you, I've mentored small businesses that have started from like really small. And today their turnover is, is big. It's big. And it, they started off with fear. And when they realized that it was only something they were selling themselves every day, I can't achieve this. You know, I'm scared. I won't be able to do this. Um, what happens if I don't achieve it? Guys, there's always going to be times where we make a goal in life and we say we want to achieve something and we don't achieve it. That is life. That is what we live here for. You know, um, whether it's like eating healthy a goal weight, you will always fail. But failure is supposed to make you better. It's supposed to make you sit back and say, okay, it really hurt to fail. But what was I doing that made me fail? And let me try again. And now attempt it the second time without doing what I've identified as the reason. It, It only improves you. It really only improves you. Thanks, Rafisa, for that answer. Um, I'm just going to go through a few more comments. Yeah, guess free Naidu. I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that name correctly, but she says, uh, such refreshing honesty. Uh, we have Atia Ghani, who has said, very inspiring. Aisha, you always inspire and speak your truth so openly. Um, guess free Naidu again. If you are not already exporting your solutions, Hopefully you can do so soon, especially with the current decline with the South African rand. Um, Nathisa, do you have anything, would you, a comment for that regarding so we've, your products? We've, we've, as a business, we've always developed uh, solutions for the, firstly, the market where we are at present, because that's where the foundation of the business was. And then as the business grew, we started um, providing solutions out of the country. So I have provided solutions into Africa. Um, I think for us, it's always determining the market, the country we're dealing with and the actual value, the firstly, the solution is going to deliver and whether we're going to get paid, because we all know there's certain countries is that you just don't get paid at. So we are definitely into and are providing solutions internationally. And yeah, so if there's an opportunity, you will find our product in that country always. Okay. Um, Azra again has said, or she's asked a question and she asks, did you find that you got more support from strangers than from people you knew or trusted to support you? Oh my God, 100%, 100%. Like at every stage that this business has even moved towards, I have never found that friends, family, people who I knew ever procured my product. And one of the reasons why I always suggest to small businesses is don't always limit your LSM. Don't don't build a business thinking you're going to sell it to your friends and your friends are going to buy it or your family is going to buy it. The people in the community are going to buy it. You know, it, it literally at times sets you up for failure. While there are certain areas where you will get that support, I personally have never found it. And to date, I never ever build my business or product according to addressing a market of a certain race or gender or LSM. Because when you design something, you must look at everyone um, or everyone within an LSM that you are wanting to provide your product. Um, If you limit yourself, I promise you it will be very disheartening. Um, And and don't go into business to sell to friends. I mean, you will, you won't make any money. You really won't make any money. I mean, I've noticed whenever, and I'm not talking about my friends, friends, but I noticed like whenever like people who've known me would come, the first thing that you would hear is like, can I have a discount or, you know, 
you know, can, can you give it to me at this price? Or we know each other for so long. And then the amount of problems you have to deal with that does not it's make not the it financially benefit. No, no, not at all. Um, okay, Aisha, the lessons you share are motivating for new and small businesses. Uh, we've got a comment here. Lol, we love the Nando's chicken recipe as well. Uh, Samira says, thanks for a most inspiring talk. Your clear vision and perseverance is admirable. Great advice given in your words. And she's uh, pr- provided uh, or quoted you uh, throughout the event. And she says, plans, create and provide direction to reach goals. Believe in what you are capable of. Hold yourself accountable when the going gets tough. Muscle up. Uh, so those are some uh, awesome take backs, I think, from this event. Um, Aisha, again, pick yourself up for the fight and start over. Keshni, thank you for investing your time in this. I'm sure everyone here benefited from this discussion. Rabia, so inspiring. Thanks so much for sharing and thanks for arranging this. Adnan, very inspiring and highly motivational. Um, a comment, absolutely true. Sometimes giving great customer service is what sets you apart from someone selling the same product. Romana, my go-to TED talk. Wow, thank you for always sharing your knowledge and experience. Prem has said, uh, okay, I'm going to go to a previous question and then I'm going to get to Prem's question. Asya has asked, how do you allow for time frames to realize if your product or service will take off? I think, Napisa, I'm just going to take um, one more question, but I think there is only one more question after this. This is the last two questions. So, you know, planning is important, um, but while you plan, you are never guaranteed that your plan is going to work. It's there to guide you. Um, it's there to create the structure. And when it comes to timeframes, um, I can tell you that there's many times, even when we launch new products into the market, that will be like, oh, you know, in six months time, you know, the uptake is going to be so much. Um, and it, it hasn't, we haven't, it hasn't materialized. So while planning is very important, never be disheartened that you, when you set a plan to be able to do a certain amount of turnover, either in units or in, 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 in a RAND value, that if you do not meet it, you have failed because it, it's just there to, it's like a vision board. It, it guides you as to what you can achieve and no matter what your numbers are, the fact is that when you started planning, you had zero. So if you plan for 20 and you achieve 10, gosh, when you started, you didn't even have 10. So that is already an indication of where you are moving. So I wanted to share on my Instagram that, you know, um, forecasting is very important. So it's now 2021 and we've already forecasted um, the units and turnover for 2022. And that is the whole 12 months. Um, we've set big goals, but we've planned it. Whether we will turn over that at the end of 12 months, it's, it's yet to be determined, but it, it's very important to create that forecast and then drive and motivate yourself towards it. Uh, this is the last question for this morning. Prem has asked, with your experience and knowledge now, is there anything you would do differently versus when you first started out? Um, no, no. Um, you know, I, when I look at all the, the areas in my life, I failed. And guys, I failed in so many areas of my life, um, personally and professionally, as I mentioned. But when I look at it back today, I don't think I would be the person I am and I'm still a work in progress. Um, had I not went through that, maybe I would be a different boss. Maybe I would be a different human being. Maybe if I didn't fail, I would probably be an arrogant person who not willing to work and assist anyone. Um, but those failures and those mistakes I made in business just made me it, it made me better. Um, when customers didn't pay, when I lost money, when people renegated on payments um, or paid me less than what I was worth, all it did was make me sharper in how I engaged with customers. When I dealt with, uh, you know, um, situations where, you know, that nearly broke me, all it did was muscle me up to be able to know that the next time I deal with something, whether it's different, I have a muscle 
that will be my backbone to be able to remind me that whatever I'm dealing with, I'll be able to overcome. So I won't change anything. I really won't change anything. And that's why the question on failure is so important. Your failure is supposed to make you stronger. It's not supposed to weaken you and you should not be scared of it. That's great advice, Tavisa. I think we always learn from our failures and our mistakes. Shabir Shohad, well done on an excellent presentation. Wow, so amazing. Well done on Twitter. Issa and Afisa, uh, Shabir is actually uh, my CEO. Thanks, Shabir. And thanks for listening in. Um, so we've reached the end of this uh, event. Uh, again, thank you so much for everyone for attending. But before we close off, at the beginning of the event, I did mention that Nafisa does host um, or have a mentorship program, which she runs. And again, I did mention that it's a private initiative. It's completely voluntary and she receives no monetary benefit from it. And although she already has her intake for the upcoming uh, period, she has agreed to give or provide one of the participants here today with a one-on-one -on -one mentorship 